Hey folks, welcome back to Combo Class. Today we're going to talk about some dice. But before we talk about all the four-sided and 12-sided and other sides of dice, let's go down to two-sided dice, which you may more familiarly know as coins. Technically, they aren't two-sided dice, but they do function pretty similarly. Here's a question that isn't as obvious as it sounds. If you were to flip four coins, assuming that each individually had a 50-50 chance of being heads or tails, what's more likely that your total results, all four flips together, would contain two heads and two tails, or that they would contain three of one type and one of another type? Now, a lot of you might expect, of course, it's the two and two. That's got to be most likely. And if we look at a chart of all 16 ways that four coins could land, sorted by how many you get of each type altogether, like there's only one way we could get four heads and no tails, and there's the four ways we could end up with three heads and one... I didn't know whether to call it one tails or one one tail. Pluralization is weird, but I went with tail. Here are the one tail options because we could have it be our fourth, third, second, or first out of our flips and forward. And it is true that compared to any other individual option, getting two heads and two tails amongst your flips with six total ways to get that, six sixteenths simplifying to three eighths, is the most likely compared to any individual one. But I asked what's more likely, getting two heads and two tails among them or getting three of one type and one of another type? That includes the three tails and one head options and the three heads and one tail options. And if you add those up, you end up with eight out of the 16 total possibilities or actually a one half chance altogether that you end up with three of one kind and one of the other kind compared to less than a one half chance that you get the two heads and two tails. Now to move forward into more sides on our dice from our two-sided dice who we're calling the coins. Let's turn this into a version that I realize this can translate into about six-sided dice. You may have heard that if you roll two six-sided dice and take the sum of the numbers, the most common result is seven. But what's more common, to have your sum be a seven or to be a number one off from a seven? Well, remember one off from a seven includes six and eight. And if we look at a chart of all the possible sums you could have, if you added up the roll from one die and the roll from another die, we see that all of the possible sums lie on these diagonal stripes. And here I also made a little graph of how likely they are to hit with the height of each of these being how many times it appears here. And we can see that seven, by landing on the longest of the diagonal stripes, gets the tallest bar and is more likely than any other individual other option. But to be one away from seven includes six and eight, giving it 10 total appearances on here, which is more likely than seven itself. Now you may have already seen this pretty classic chart because six-sided dice are pretty common, but here's a fun little twist on it that occurred to me. These sums are ending up with some of the numbers being bigger than a single die could have generated. What if we wanted to make a chart of sums but have them all turn into something between one and six? So what if we took any number on this chart that was bigger than six and subtracted six from it? Here's a chart of all the possibilities if we added two six-sided dice and then subtracted six if the result was bigger than six. And it's very similar to a modular arithmetic addition table if we were in mod six, although that would write the sixes as zeros as well. 
But what does this do to the distribution chart from before? Well, I removed all the possibilities where the sum was greater than six, because that's no longer a possibility. And I left the ones the lower values had to start them off, because their appearances from before are still gonna be valid. We didn't subtract anything if it was six or lower. But what do we get added onto these? Well, one shows up six times now because it took all the times seven had appeared. And two gets five new appearances in addition to its one old one because all the eights turned into twos over here. And three gets four new appearances. Four gets three new appearances. Five gets two new appearances. Six gets one new appearance and they all end up with exactly six appearances on the chart, meaning they all have a one in six chance of happening. So if we play this whole game, we end up with the same probability as if we rolled just one six-sided die. So if you play that whole game, it's essentially like rolling two dice and getting the result from rolling one die. Whereas it would be a lot more practical to do the opposite and roll one die and get the re result of two die, which is why I got all these dice in dice. Those basically you could get two rolls at once. In fact, I should have been using these this whole time. I would have saved so much time with all the double dice I was rolling. Now there's lots you could do with one of these double dice or with two regular dice that this functions like. And a lot of games have you take the sum of two dice numbers, but I feel like games should have a little more creativity and versatility and have you do more different things with the two numbers you get from the rolls. Like what if you rolled one of these or two regular dice and just took the larger of the two numbers to be your result? What would that chart look like? So here's a chart of all of the possibilities. If you rolled two six-sided dice and your result was just the larger of the two values that you got. And before we talk about any probability stuff here, I gotta point out a cool visual pattern that's hidden here, which is that if we look at the appearances of each number, they each come in an L shape which has an odd number amount in it. Like there's one of those, three of those, five of those, seven of those. And as we go forward in numbers, we're building squares in total. And this basically is a demonstration that the sum of the first n odd numbers is the nth square number. Now talking about the probability here, if we say which value is the most common, we gotta start being careful because six has the highest frequency compared to any other number. But if most common meant average, the most frequent is no longer the average. Using average in the way of adding up all the values and dividing by how many values there were. So when we have what's called the mode of the data, the value that has the highest singular frequency compared to any other value, not being the average, we gotta be careful to specify what types of common we're looking for in a chart. And average itself can really trick you because often the average value of something isn't even a possible value you could get. Like if I say the average number on one of the faces of this die, the average is 3.5, but none of the faces has a 3.5 on it. Like you might have an average household size that has like two and a half people, but I doubt that many households have half a person in them. So you gotta be careful with averages. Now that's why going forward, when I say most frequent, let's assume that I just mean the mode, the one that occurs the most as a singular option compared to any other singular option. For our next experiment about what you could do with two dice or one double die, which I'm surprised more games don't have you do, is instead of taking the sum of two numbers, take the difference. Like there's a two and a five, so the difference is three. 
If I did that, what do you think would be the most frequent number I would hit as a difference? And what if instead of using six-sided dice, I used two 12-sided dice? Like there the difference is four. Then with two 12-sided dice, what do you think the most frequent number to hit as a difference would be? Well, it might surprise you to find out that not only with six-sided dice, is the most frequent difference one. But with two 12-sided dice, the most frequent difference is also just one. And even with two 100-sided dice, the most frequent difference you'd get if you rolled the two of them would be one, which is kind of perplexing, because you might think that as you went up in how many big numbers were allowed to be on the dice, that the most frequent difference at some point would go up. Or you might think that if it was going to be as low as one, why not be as low as zero, which is a possible difference? To sh so to show why one is so efficient, and going to have the most appearances on a chart of this sort, where we make a chart, as usual, of rolling two six-sided dice, and this time writing down the differences between them, we see that numbers lie on these diagonal stripes, and that zero is on the longest stripe, but that all the others happen twice in a symmetrical way, and that one is the closest to the longest stripe without being on it. So one is the number that happens the most times on that chart and thus the most likely as a single frequency. And same if we look at two 12-sided dice. Zero lies on the diagonal happens in a non-mirrored way. So one lying closest to that longest diagonal while still getting doubled has the most amount of appearances and is the most frequent difference. And this is why I did that tangent about averages earlier, because if we looked at the average on one of these, it wouldn't be one, it would be larger than that. But looking at the mode or singular most frequent frequent value in comparison to any other single one. We get one as our winner, no matter how many numbers we had on our dice, as long as it's two dice with the same amount on each of them. Some of the other ways we could roll two dice and have the numbers interact to create some new result would have even more skewed differences between their mode or most frequent one and their average. Like if my rule was that I roll two six-sided dice and I take whichever was the lower of the two numbers to the power of the higher of the two, like if I rolled that, it would be one to the power of two, I'd get a one, and one would be the most frequent result to hit. But because I could get other stuff like three to the sixth power doing that game, the average would be massive. With two six-sided dice, you can also copy the exact probabilities that other types of dice would make. Meaning that if I roll this double die, if I have the right rule set up for how I interact those two numbers, this could act like a 12-sided die or other types. The way we could make it copy a 12-sided die, for example, is I could say, the smaller die, I take that as a number, and then if the bigger die rolls a one, two, or three, I keep the smaller number the same, and if the bigger die rolls a four, five, or six, I add six to the smaller number. And that would actually give me exact equal chances of hitting any number between one and 12, just like a normal 12-sided die does. And in fact, with the right tweaks to that, you could have two six-sided dice or one double one fairly copy a four-sided die, a nine-sided die, a two or three-sided die, which you can't even make out of normal dice shapes, a 12-sided die, an 18-sided die, or a 36-sided die. So for your own challenge someday, try and figure out what would be the simplest, most elegant rules for how you'd interact two numbers of two six-sided dice,
to copy some of those. And for a bigger challenge, you could also see, what if I had multiple of them? What other types of dice would I be able to copy? And that will be something we will cover in the combo class at some point. So there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with a few six-sided dice, and there's even more you can do with them if your six-sided dice aren't forced to have one, two, three, four, five, six as the exact numbers on their faces, which is why I got a bunch of blank dice to design some of my own dice to show you guys some real cool things later. All right, that should be all the ones I spilled. Thank you for joining me here today in combo class to learn about some dice. Hope you have a great day and I'll see you next episode.